Thank you for joining. Lovely to have you on this summer evening. I know I can see a lot of people coming from around the country, so thank you so much. Oh, wow. And we've got the Northern Lights even. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm just going to wait a few minutes while people are joining. And um, then ask that um, you keep muted uh, just to give you a sense of the flow. I'm going to start out by um, uh, having a, a little conversation with John, our guest and letting you get to know him through those those questions. And then I'm very excited that today you'll get to meet uh, Kale Holmes, who is the new coordinator of our China's Not Our Enemy campaign. And Kale will take over from me to um, ask the next round of a uh, couple of questions, and then you'll have a chance to ask questions also. So that's kind of the flow of our time together. Um, so looks like we're getting some more folks in. Just give me a couple of minutes before I start. Um, as people are entering, it takes a little while to let everybody in from the waiting room. And I just also want to thank Grace, um, who's here. She's um, one of the just core bedrocks of Code Pink that makes everything happen. And she's here to support us tonight to make sure that this gets recorded and put up on YouTube and also live streamed on our Twitter. So Grace, thanks for being with us while you're um, cooking dinner at home in Chicago. So also feel free to put in the chat where you're um, joining us from your name and where you're joining us from so folks can see you know, who, who out there cares about peace and from where, it's always fun to know. Um, all right, We're, we've got um, a good group in, so I think I'll get started. Just checking with Grace that we're good to go on um, it's streaming. Yeah, it's being slow, but it'll start true. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, welcome to Code Pink and another episode of China is Not Our Enemy. I'm Jody Evans, one of the co founders of Code Pink. And I started this campaign about three and a half years ago when I saw the same playbook that took us to war in Iraq playing out towards China. And I couldn't believe that the U.S. would think it was a good idea to go in war, to war on China, a nuclear power, um, especially since in this moment in history, we should be cooperating with China on very serious issues like climate change, AI, and the needs of the people globally. So, you know, the campaign has evolved over time and um we, we try to focus on a few things. First of all, that from sanctions to military expansion, the US is already preparing and driving us to war with China. So we talk about those things. The campaign aims to stop this US war on China instead of pivot that energy to cooperation. So we focus on where should we be cooperating? Where's cooperating and happen? And how does that look? Which is in many ways, when it's happening, it looks awesome. And it's what should continue to happen and where the focus should be. Um, hostilities are already derailing engagement on you know, key existential problems around, especially the climate crisis. And you know, especially when you look at China that's producing, I think somebody said 80% of the solar panels um, and our trade with China is so um, extreme and needed as we've seen with uh, Janet Yellen's concerns about what would it mean if we the US decoupled from China. So, you know, paying attention to what those issues are. It already has casualties this drive to war on China and they're Asian Americans. There are also indigenous peoples of the islands around China and the peoples of the Asia Pacific who are threatened by the war on China. 
And that's where we're going to have this conversation about today. It's like we we hear all this propaganda and we all, hear all these voices, you know, anything that goes wrong, it must be China's fault. And we, we're real, I'm really excited with our guests to be able to look from Asia back at the United States, which isn't a view we get to hear from often. And then of course, you know, what brought me to this campaign is that it's propaganda and lies that weaponize our hearts and minds and take us to war. And um, we saw that just this week with the Pew, recent Pew poll that showed that 50% of the United States thinks the most dangerous thing to the US in this moment in history is China. And that was all created by propaganda. Um, so, um, you know, the cost of uh, this hate and making enemies um, our lives and the planet. So we're here to help unpack that, help give you talking points to have conversations with those around you because it's each one of us in conversation that can help debunk uh, all these tools that are used to drive a war. Um, so uh, I'd like to now introduce our guest. I had the pleasure of being with John on, on his conversation with his friends on Friday and Kale will post that link in the chat. It was a really fun conversation. And um, so now we get to just learn about John and hear from him. He's been a policy and strategy advisor in government and business across East Asia for two decades. He has held senior fellowship at Columbia University, New York University Stern, and the Raja Atnam School of International Studies, Singapore, where he helped start the Center for Multilateralism Studies. As director of a leading investment bank in Southeast Asia, he founded a research institute and later a council of business leaders to support regional economic integration. He is a former official in the Malaysian government. He was educated in the London School of Economics and Stanford University. He is interested in framing the political theology of international relations discourse, especially as it applies to China, East Asia, and the question of the whole world order. So welcome, John. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's great That's to be here very, with you. Very impressive resume that you have, John. Not at so all. My first question to you is with that, you know, all that you have done in your life, what has brought you to this moment? Like, what have you seen from all those different vantage points that brings you to this concern about China not being our enemy? Um, I have actually watched this um, escalation to this point uh, over the, at least the, the last decade. Um, it began with this uh, pivot to Asia, which uh, uh, came across my desk or came to my attention, so to speak, as I was working on uh, ASEAN. I was then running the, the um, an ASEAN Research Institute, and I was uh, very much involved in um, efforts at regional integration. That is that you, you have to know that there is an, a, an effort to build a peaceful uh, economic region uh, with, uh, with uh, free trade uh, and uh, investment and so forth. And of course, uh, trans transportation links as well across Southeast Asia. Um, but also, I, I think increasing at that time, there was also the idea with, with China, because there was uh, in 2010, a China ASEAN um, free trade area came into effect. So very, very early. Um, and so it, in the middle of this, and right after the financial crisis, uh, we heard about this pivot to Asia business with um, an article by, uh, it, it began with an article by Secretary of State and uh, Hillary Clinton. I think it was called uh, something like uh, America's Pacific Century. Um, and uh, she called for a, well, it announced this sort of pivot uh, and a large, and this really was a pivot in America's attention, strategic attention from uh, the Middle East from, and, and you know, we were still embroiled in the war in Afghanistan at that point 
to Asia. And uh, some of the, I was just looking at it just a moment ago, and uh, some of the, the lines in it are, are really striking. So you have to understand that uh, things date from, from there. But um, we can go into it uh, later. I, I don't want to go into the weeds of that right now, uh, but I'd like to later if we have a chance. Um, but I was already quite um, un uncomfortable with it uh, because I didn't see China as a, a, a as a threat, and this was very clearly directed at a kind of um, at that point uh, soft encir encirclement of, of China. So you know the TPP came about at that time as well. But in my own biography, I then had to come to the to the U.S. Um, quite quite suddenly in uh, late uh, 2016. And uh, from there, it's been a, an absolutely kind of amazing, a tumultuous time. Uh, things have, 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 have changed, uh, escalated, uh, deteriorated to, and, uh, to an extraordinary degree. It, it, you know, even knowing the trajectory then, uh, uh, you know, one sees the, the, the full, the, the thing in, in, in sort of um, at, at at, at full pace right now. And I think the propaganda that we're all uh, experiencing is, is a big part of it. The most disturbing thing is um, absolutely unhinged propaganda campaign, propaganda and misinformation campaign uh, about China, but uh, by extension about, about Asia. Uh, so one thing I want to talk about, you know, today, if we get a chance, is the extent to which things are quite linked there. And if you're attacking Sort of the Chinese economy, you're also attacking the Asian economy uh, and the Southeast Asian economy. So, so it's 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 through that that I became um, yet more more engaged. But it just became absolutely nuts. Um, I think the Hong Kong uh, riots actually were were a, a kind of turning point in my sort of decision to 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 you know basically speak up. Yeah, we can, can talk describe, about it more. Yeah, if you could yeah. describe that for, you know, those here, because you're closer to being able to understand it than people in the United States, because we're living in the stories we get told in the media, but you are have a different understanding. So maybe if you could share what the shock was for you and how you saw it. The Hong Kong, um, you have to realize, is a kind of second place, a very, very familiar place to a lot of uh, Asians, Southeast Asians, um, and particularly to the um, overseas Chinese community, you know, of which I'm a member. Um, there are about 30 million overseas Chinese in, in Southeast Asia. So I come from uh, Malaysia, where, where you know, about a quarter of the population is Chinese. But whether you're Chinese or not, people are quite are very, very used to going to Hong Kong. And many of us have family there. It's a, you know, it's, it's a bit like, a, for me, it, it was like, if you're from the West Coast, something like East Coast, and, and it's not much, it's, it's about that distance, uh, you know, as a flight. Um, wait, how long is it? Uh, what was the, the flight time? Five. It's less than that. Yeah. Right? It's about three hour flight from right. Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I have family there, so I know the place and I know what it feels like. And these protests that cast the issue in that particular light, as if Hong Kong was this, you know, a tota this totalitarian, authoritarian place without uh, what was being demanded, were absolutely ludicrous. I'm sure you've all you've heard it before, and and we're not, you know, I don't want to go into every particular issue. But the place never had uh, universal suffrage. In all the years, 90 plus years of, of, of uh, British rule, uh, there was never an election. Right? In fact, a rather brutal repression of, of, of protests at certain times in the late 60s, for example. Uh, but right after 97, uh, you, you have this, and there were elections. Hong Kong does have elections. Uh, only you don't elect the leader of Hong Kong directly. Remember that Hong Kong is not a sovereignty. It's not a, a polity. It's, you know, it's like New York, legally, as far as the, um, 
as China is concerned, you know, and and probably somewhat less uh, uh, sort of uh, stroppy about its distinctness, in fact, than uh, from from the rest of the country than New, New York City, right? Or, or just about as 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 insistent on it, but. Uh, the, here was this idea that you had to have direct elections for the chief executive of Hong Kong uh, or else it wasn't a democracy. But they did have wide consultation. They had a system in which you had different groups of parts of society um, uh, represented and also election for representatives. But the chief executive, um, the, the only requirement from the central government and from the system was that um, the nomin the candidates Right, were were uh, approved or were not vetoed by 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 Beijing, um, and so there there you had it. You you we had we have elections in in Hong Kong. Uh, it's not sort of direct elections. Neither do you have direct elections in the United States. Correct. We have um, uh, elections, but selection the same as China. Yeah. <laughs> elections and selection, but you have an electoral college. Right. right. This is not Switzerland, um, but the enormous hypocrisy of that, and then the protests were something else. They began as something, and then developed into this. Imagine a year-long January six, and in fact, the relevant comparison is that well, you had uh, we had the capital uh, sort of uh, invaded here, uh, and people call it an insurrection. Uh, you call these people terrorists, and so on. You hunt them down. Well, Hong Kong had that. You know, the legislature was broken into and defaced in uh, and and sort of wrecked in a place that, like, uh, you know, un unlike uh, the, the capital. And so, all that was being excused away, or rather portrayed. Uh, the the students were, oh, not the students. The the protesters were portrayed as freedom fighters, democracy heroes. Let me get more, more direct and even more personal about it. I actually tried to teach a course on this as this thing was going on. You know, I, um, I was teaching uh, a, a joint course with, uh, and the plan was to have a joint program with Hong Kong University. That would have been amazing. So um, I was at, um, and at, at my college, uh, we shan't em embarrass anybody here, but we, so I would run the course with a bunch of students here, and the idea was to um, to study the protests, to think about them as they were going on. Because of course there were issues, all kinds of issues we wanted to get into. And I wanted to get at the tremendous economic issues. Hong Kong is capitalism on, you know, on steroids. It, it is the most laissez-faire place in the world. Freedom House, uh, the Cato Institute, they love Hong Kong. Every year it comes out number one in freedom. I kid you not. I mean, I not, unironically, it is uh, in every on every such index before the freest place on earth. Well, that's the neoliberal notion of freedom. It's very easy to start a company and do business and so on. But especially after 97, it became more and more um, the province of the, it was always controlled by by by. The, the economy was always dominated by tycoons. Well, the word tycoon is, comes from Cantonese, right? But uh, by these big bosses. And the real estate sector is, is very powerful. And uh, rents there are sky high. People have a very, very difficult time. So you have what, what felt to me like a huge bunch of disaffected youth, but there were all kinds of reasons for them to be unhappy. Um, but, and then one began to see clear signs of, of unmistakable signs of instigation. So actually for me, it was seeing it, you know, almost embarrassed to say, it's like, this is when it happens to you, to your own society. Uh, you know, color revolutions. Uh, so it's one thing. And, and when, when they happen in Egypt and so on, you know, I could stand, uh, you know, I could be quite un, uncritically sort of think, wow, this is a great thing or, or cheer them on when it happens to your own society. And then you start to see this complete mismatch, black being made into white, 
uh, it's really quite an experience. I'm not the only one. Uh, Hong Kong was a turning point for a bunch of guys like me. Uh, you know, if you look at my profile, I, I'm not, <laughs> uh, you know, I was not the activist. Okay, I worked in, I worked for an investment bank for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know, I was a Davos guy. Right. But once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. You cannot unsee uh, people being fed certain lines and the media just lying to uh, 180 degrees day by day for a year about what was going on. So it was it was way too much for 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 a whole bunch of people. You know, these are, uh, you know, Southeast Asian uncles like myself, right, if you will, these middle aged guys who are very comfortable. The whole Western thing, you know, uh, you know, I, I worked in all these C-suite things, Fortune 500 companies, right? Uh, once you have seen that, um, you'll see, wait a second, you, it isn't just accidental. Uh, it isn't just these media people carried away by their own, uh, sort of their own beliefs. No, there was clear suppression of what was going on. Uh, those kids... Uh, these protesters were, there was a very, very strong right wing and racist element, believe it or not. Uh, and they were literally, you know, clubbing people on the head, right? Hitting people with bricks. They set, set a man on fire. They were stabbing policemen. Not a single protester was killed. If you had tried any of this in New York, you know, or in LA, right? Yeah, you know, you'd, been, you'd have been shot for sure. And the Hong Kong police managed that for a year. And Beijing, right, despite all the bloodthirsty, uh, you could see the press wanting to see a Tiananmen incident in, in, in Hong Kong. And of course, they were too smart not you know, to do that. Uh, so e even the, the PLA, which has a barracks in, in Hong Kong, I mean, they, they, they provoked them. Uh, they provoked the embassy. Or the, or the, or the, or the, not the embassy, but the um, the Chinese government presence there tried to set it on fire, but they didn't uh, resist. So it was a, a you know, it, there was a tremendous restraint, and the city went through hell. My aunt was there again, very personal. You know, she couldn't come downstairs; she was afraid. She's she's in her eighties. There are a whole bunch of people that this thing it completely doesn't give a, give a damn about, right? Ordinary people uh, of Hong Kong who want to get on with their lives being terrorized. So, no, that 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 was that was something. So one so knows things, yeah, theoretically, but to to see it in action, um, you know, brings it home. So that was your turning point. I mean, mine was noticing yeah. the propaganda and saying, "Oh my God, this is how the United States always goes to war with lies and propaganda." Absolutely, absolutely. I share that with you. Yeah. And so you're seeing the same kind of lies and distortion, but you're seeing it much more personally in relationship to your experience of what's that's, happening, and then that's how, yeah. That's right. That's right. And and really, the the worrying thing, and and this, of course, you know, you you. You remind us of all the time. The really scary thing is to see the um, the progression, the playbook. First, the propaganda, then the demonization, and then stuff happens. You know, they're not they're, they don't vary it too much. It's a playbook that works. And again, you, we saw it happen with uh, Ukraine. This is, I'm very familiar with the issue from from 2014 onwards. Um, but I didn't realize it would, you know, be allowed to get to this point. Uh, but then you see the, de the, the, the demonization, but the demonization of China, uh, this Hong Kong, and, the, and what's been happening over, over Taiwan, the crossing of very, very clear red lines, um, those uh, all lead up to something. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's really worrying what it leads up to. Yeah, so, so the, the propaganda is not, incidental it's not accidental it accelerates you can observe its progress and it doesn't lead to a good place we have seen time and again correct um and and the distortion confuses everyone because if you're not on the ground if you're not from there if you don't understand but every day for like you said a year 
you're getting propaganda, it's very hard to have a true relationship with what's happening um, because you're having Indeed. Indeed it is. hard for us. So yes, yes. Um, earlier- I, I think I've seen how it works. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's really like uh, stigmatization, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's throwing just stuff on, on so much stuff on you, so much crap out there, frankly, that no one dares engage with it. Not on any intellectual grounds, but it's just just messy, and you don't want to be associated with it. So it it works on this sort of social uh, dynamics. It's it's not based on 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 reason. It becomes discrediting. It becomes sort of beyond the pale to discuss certain things, right? And I, you know, by talking about these things, I I I'm beyond the pale <laughs> right? oh, in this society, at least. Right? Exactly. What I'm giving, what I'm trying to say is, a lot of this is basic common sense out, out in Asia. But one thing this does is set the Western population so far from what is common sense, and what what I would maintain is most of the world, but especially in Asia, you guys have to have <laughs> you, you sense it. It's really quite terrifying. Or oh, it's uh, it it really really alienates um, the the kind of elite class, the pundit class of the West from, from the common sense um, of, of Asian people. This, this experience of Hong Kong, for example, a very well-known, uh, very respected uh, statesman, a, a friend of mine, as it happens, um, George Yeo, former uh, foreign minister of Singapore. If you look up some of his talks on YouTube, you know, a guy who had been foreign minister for many years, Brigadier General in the in the in the Singapore uh, Armed Forces. This is not a guy who's a radical in any way, or you know, someone very comfortable with U.S. power in East Asia. Ah, that was too much for him. The Hong Kong thing. There is no way to talk about it nicely, uh, or to talk about it honestly, while remaining on basically remaining polite with what the West has done to it and how it is talking about Hong Kong. The great news is it's now under control. It, uh, you know, they, they implemented a national security law, such as you find in every country. That was just the one gap that Hong Kong had. Yeah, so I, 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 I don't want to make this a seminar about Hong Kong, but anybody curious about it, I, I can go on about it. I thought I taught an entire course in it. Well, well, thank you, because I think what you're talking about, and I, I want to go back to your words, you know, it's like it creates a stigmatization, stigmatization so yeah. let's talk about that yeah. because um, there's Hong Kong or there's, it, it's like <laughs> even Kayla and I were talking about the way we see the world because we've been through China, to China, but that we can't right. even talk about with anyone else because it makes us feel crazy. Absolutely. And Absolutely. so I think yeah. that's the part that's that the you're part. talking about. It's like, yes. so do you experience that? And I, I just like gratitude for you being here with us because obviously you don't experience it silencing you because you're here. But have you over the time felt it silencing you and have you had to build up your uh, courage or your capacity that no matter whether it silenced you or not, you felt it more important to speak because the, the let's, stigmatization is Let's just say I have lost my... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, positions and opportunities uh, over my speaking out. Uh huh. Yeah, it so hasn't you, been. It hasn't been free. Uh, yeah, it hasn't been free. So, uh, yes, I have. I've just been willing to to do it. Well, I have uh, more. I just couldn't keep quiet about it. Sorry. So, so I, I, yeah, I have lost uh, those uh, positions. I, I'm no longer at these places, nor do they want to be associated with me, mm -hmm. because decent people don't talk like me. Mm. So now, I think one one thing is this. Uh, I mentioned political the theology, sort of, you know, in 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 my bio, but um, but one might also talk about political anthropology. That is that when when you engage in these in these disputes with people, you're not you're naive if you think that oh. You're in the space of reasons. You're naive if it's about if it's if you think it's epistemology, 
right? This is what liberals like to pretend. It's all just, you know, the space of reason, right? Uh, no, uh, it's uh, the, the, a clear refrain for understanding this. Stigmatization, for example, is uh, the religious one, or, or in terms of, of religious anthropology. This is pollution. Stigma, indeed, right? A pollution. It's between the, the, the uh, um, you know, this, uh, this is a phenomenon in religion. I, I put this stuff on you and it, you know, and you are therefore impure. So it's, they're, they're working with, with that. They make entire topics. They make China, anything around China becomes that. And if you are associated with that, you are also the impure. Now, the, these, these phenomena are, are quite deadly. Um, it, so from a certain perspective, the U.S. continues to be it sort of, like a village, you know, um, Salem, circa 1800s, or was it 1700s? The Salem witchcraft trials. Uh, so that the, the the phenomena of the uh, the witch hunt, the, I'm not just talking metaphorically. I'm not just talking about being being uh, colorful here. These are the dynamics that are mobilized, right? But except by the massive apparatus of, of state uh, propaganda, state and state-affiliated media, and, and one discovers an entire uh, media class of people who are prepared to play this game. They either get something out, they, some satisfaction out of it, or uh, again, another thing I've seen is how they are rewarded for it. You know, from my perspective, the U.S. looks like, you know, it's like looking at a village of really superstitious people. <laughs> you know, it's a small, it's it's like a village of, of, of what it is, semi, semi-literate semi uh, um, sort of witchcraft uh, believers, but witchcraft phenomena are real in the anthropological sense. You can do this to people. And another age, so if I may, a kind of Southeast Asian perspective, I just tweeted about it yesterday, is the understanding that the, of the relationship between this and mass murder. Because it has happened uh, time and again in, in Southeast Asia, quite often to the uh, Chinese community, but not just to them. Um, so the Indonesian massacre of 1965, for example, that is just forgotten maybe 800,000 people or a million people were, were killed by hand, okay? Shot, uh, you know, bludgeon over their head, stabbed, strangled, um, until the rivers ran red, literally. How did this happen? Uh, quite recently, um, these documents were released uh, about U.S. Uh, no U.K. involvement in this. Uh, the British are very very good at this. They had an entire unit uh, for spreading black propaganda, and the black propaganda included stories such as you know these communists. So this was the mass slaughter. Uh, just to recount the, the the broad outline of the largest communist party in the world outside of China. It was peaceful. It was unarmed, which was perhaps their, um, their, their, you know, fatal for them. So they were, they were demonized. It was an argument. It was portraying them as like demons, as murderers. And then there were these atrocity stories, you know, they would do these horrible things to people, etc. And this came out of a newsletter run out of Singapore, laundered tr through several countries and purporting to be Indonesian. In Indonesian, it was by a bunch of Brits. Okay, this is completely in now it's in public domain. When you see what these witchcraft sacrifice mob violence things do, and I was very aware of this in Hong Kong. Okay, uh, you take it a lot more seriously. This isn't just about you know it's unpleasant for me as a Chinese person. No, because I know the intimate relationship between these processes of victimization, right, and mob sacrifice. Because in Hong Kong, again, you saw the, the, the crowd, the mob, 
and mob behavior. A mob is something else, you know, than, than, than six people, you know, <laughs> discussing a, a book. Um, so well, you're also talking um, they about play with these phenomena. And you are seeing this also being played with on a mass scale in, in, in the U.S. This is just a, a perspective on this. So, so these things, this black propaganda has huge effects on people in Southeast Asia. It's not, you know, not just you get beaten up in the subway, okay? <laughs> There's a mass murder. One of my earliest memories uh, was, was of one of these incidents. So, yeah. I mean, you're talking about what happened in Rwanda. You're yes. talking about yes. what happened. But really, this is what happened in Germany. I mean, because that fascism right. was a mob right. behavior where right. the mob was, you know, riled up around uh, the same thing with Jews by the same stories. By the well, same they knew how to invoke this. Yes, yes. Yes. And the people who invoke it very, very well, uh, you know, people on this side, actually. Yes. yes. Yeah. If you look at the largest propaganda apparatus in the world and what it is doing, so it's quite a shock. You know, look at me educated in the UK and so on to, to, to realize, wait a second, these people are doing this scientifically, right, deliberately. And well, they've done it to all kinds of people. And now that they're, they're, they're back at it, they did it in, in, in Indonesia. Uh, they used it in Malaysia. The Cold War was fought also in Malaya and in Indonesia. It's just people forget it. All the stuff you, you, you hear about Vietnam, strategic hamlets, in other words, mass interning people, Agent Orange, all these were pioneered by the British in Malaya. They, you know, they consulted and, and, and taught the, the Americans in, in Vietnam. So, there is a history to these to these things, and you know that I was just talking to I mean with with Jody right about this sort of wake up. There are people very very kind of well behaved straight down the line people Nuri Vitachi for example, this extraordinary really really fun guy right this this extraordinary um, journalist I've been reading him since I was a kid that's a long time ago, uh, based in Hong Kong. He too. He was a supporter. He, he started out supporting those protests, which began long ago, by the way, 2014, umbrella protests and so on. And he saw with his own eyes in this recent uh, set of protests, U.S. officials handing out the lines, teaching them to ask for, you know, to be saved by Donald Trump. So, uh, so you see this, this, this manipulation. And uh, I have an absolute horror of this this kind of manipulation. It's uh, you know, yeah, well, draws I, the line there. I think that's that's the same with you know what we do at Code Pink. It's that we see the smoke, and when you yeah. see the smoke, you're supposed to put out the fire, not flow, yes. you know, blow more oxygen on it so it turns into a full blown fire and 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 does destroy people. And I so appreciate your grounding us in these are lives this is this is murderous this ends up really really ugly and yes um, these are people who are living in peace with each other yeah you know? so it shouldn't we we need to take this seriously it's not light and the the fact that this pew poll just came out and said that you know when americans are asked what is the greatest threat to the united states they say china when china's done nothing that could be a right, threat to right, the United States. Right. And where they're suffering floods and um yes. you know fires and uh you know home homelessness in their cities. But the greatest threat is China. Right. Is also right. that distortion of like we can't we're not getting anything else taken care of. If everything can be blamed on China, then um and we can go to war with China right, it right, all be better right. when yes. that's a witchcraft you're talking about that's a fantasy on steroids because no that will just make everything worse that is a right. real issue. yeah right right so yeah. there is the the conceptual part if you ask somebody on the street well what's the greatest threat and then if uh he or she says back oh well it's 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 china on one level you know and we went over this in our in, in the space you might it may not be that deep it may just be well this person realizes that's the right answer <laughs> they hear it every night right on, on on every mainstream uh ch channel um but it it doesn't it doesn't stop there if it was only that 
China is too far away for people to bother with going to war with. Uh, the, the propaganda doesn't stop there. It's not at the level of argument. So if you see the coverage, it isn't just actual argument about China doing this, China doing that. It's China bad in every reference possible. Every reference, every photograph, every photograph that comes out is a security camera, a guard. They literally fil you know, put on a, a dark, grim filter, a cloudy day. What the hell is going on here? You, you know, so every single image is a negative image. So they're playing on the, this, this phenomenon. They're othering it. They are quite, honestly, they're, they're scapegoating it. And, and this scapegoating phenomena is, is kind of, uh, it, it is also politically the, the diversion. Scapegoating is, 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 is political right. diversion, right? right? That's another reason why it's so strong here. Because we need um, a lot of diversions. <laughs> right, right. And so one worries that uh, as it gets, things get uh, more and more out of control back here for reasons internal to this place, uh, that there's more of this scapegoating because uh, it's the one thing that people um, can agree on. Well, and that's the other point. The the agreement, even though the agreement right. is uh, right. the cost of their their lives, uh, yeah. Yes. So, yes. um, you know, I I just would like to go back because you started that you had just read. You know, we were talking about the pivot to Asia, or that's where you started, and you said I was just looking back and reading some things from back then. I think you said from Hillary Clinton or something. Yes. Um, can you, what was it that you saw then that you found so interesting? Well, she had certain statements, right? Like uh, she had to make this argument for turning to Asia after uh, the administration had been focused on the war on terror and uh, the Middle East. And they were failing, failing at that, so they needed a diversion. <laughs> That's right. Um, so they had to say, well, we have to come here and the words were harness uh, Asia's growth and dynamism. You know, this is central to our strategic interests and a key priority for President uh, Obama. Harness, harness. Yes, harness Asia's like growth heart. and dynamism. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, so, and uh, the U.S. portrays itself as maintaining peace and security across the Pacific as so there's this whole Pax, Pax Americana idea, right? Uh, so j another, you know, a great paragraph from her is uh, just as Asia is critical to America's future and engaged, America is vital to Asia's future. The region is eager for our leadership and our business, perhaps more so than at any time in modern history. We are the only power with a network of strong alliances in the region no territorial ambitions and a long record of providing for the common good. This is, you know, it's hilarious actually in retrospect. Reading it at the time, I wouldn't have been able to, I wasn't going to, wouldn't have laughed as I do now. Right? This is a country that has, I don't know, three, four hundred bases in, um, in Asia <laughs> and no territorial am ambitions while you maintain these bases in South Korea, Japan, uh, you know. And all the and, islands and and, 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 and all the, the islands around, yeah. And, and bases in other countries as well, small bases and and, and large. But um, the, the issue that they used that? Right back then uh, was this freedom of navigation. And it puzzled me at the time because, wait, all those uh, sea lanes, they all go to China. If you're worried, I mean, it's not that China is going to blockade itself. Who is threatening freedom of navigation. So what they do is they come up with a concept. And, you know, I was at the, uh, a, 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 a think tank, a, a strategy and st a strategic and international studies type of think tank. Um, and uh, very, which would look at things from a military and strategic perspective. So all of a sudden, when they bring this concept out, I think what a lot of us would have thought is, wait, uh, there's something I don't know here. You know, there's this phenomenon of these people are smarter than me. They seem to use this vocabulary and there are concepts in there that I, you know, maybe there are, there are things happening that I don't know about. Actually, that, there's nothing behind it. This is like rules-based order. Mm -hmm. 
you say, what, what the hell is rules-based order? There must be something, you know, something sophisticated that I don't understand. Well, actually, it's, sim- it's as simple as my rules, you take the orders. <laughs> right? It's a way of not talking about international law. It's <laughs> Which, a totally you know, empty it, concept. So you have yeah. these totally empty concepts being put out there. And then I saw diplomats from, you know, from Japan and then from the US as well. And one voice after another echoing this. It's amazing. They all have the same vocabulary all of a sudden. This new vocabulary comes out and they're all parroted. It's, it's something to watch. So I, I, I saw that kind of build up. I didn't realize it would build up to this. Well, I, I'm, I'm thankful that you like talked about what, how you read Hillary the first time and how you read it now and how we're not even aware of how the information that we get distorts our thinking and allows us to accept things um, with an imperialist mindset, even as we're peace activists or even as we care for the planet or we're not even aware of the contortion of our own thinking um, and where we are in our lives. Right, Um, right. And so you, you, you said, and I'm, you know, that you've paid prices for telling the truth. Um, And so before we move to Kale, to let, let Kale ask him questions, you know, what in you encouraged you to tell the truth, even though you knew you were going to pay prices? And then what has happened since you've paid those prices? Have you become more silent? Have you decided to stay with the integrity of truth? Like, if you could unpack that a little bit. I think it was, a in, in the first place, an isolating experience, which is how it's meant to work on you. Um, you lose friends. Uh, you, lose, you lose being an acceptable member of a certain you know, circle, certain class. Right? Um, and uh, you realize that they... they 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 surround themselves with a, with with a certain worldview, and within that worldview, there are these assumptions that you don't question, and you then realize that one of those assumptions is American empire, and and actually, we we ought to be thankful for the last few years and the return of um, Western supremacy, as you know, in your face. Uh, you know, it, it, it's nice to have um, the quiet part spoken out loud. And it is, it is also white supremacy. Um, if behind it all, there is, when I, when I talked about the stigmatization, there is racial stigmatization going on. It's an essential, essential to this. You might wonder, well, these people don't need to do this. They're too smart. Well, we're behind that. You know, we're talk. We don't need to talk about you know being, bringing civilization to people, right? Or Christianity or whatnot. We have democracy now and justice. No, it's not enough to do that. You do have to racialize the chinks. You do have to associate them with certain images, and you see that happening in the media. Your images of disease, for example, a, a COVID. What proportion of the U.S. is Asian American? Is Asian, and yet. The predominant image is of some yellow-faced, some Asian person. Even in Germany, it was really, it's hilarious to go back over these things. So then you have the tagging, the, the, the association with disease. This is all old stuff. We know this from what was done to the Jews. We know this from what was done to the, you know, the Chinese way back. The association with disease, for example, right? These people coming across, these coolies, they were the bearers of disease. Therefore, they had to be expelled. So the the racial thing is very strong. Now I'm not someone, as I said, who you know, for whom sp- speaking about that was was part of you know the day the way I operated. Remember, I was in polite circles. Uh, and if you're talking about well, you know, international relations, oh no, you don't suddenly talk about you know white supremacy and settler colonialism. And yet these are essential to understanding what's going on. So this is a very interesting moment. This is when these old things come out and they just come out and say it. Um, you know, I, I, in that way, it's, it's, it's interesting and it's uh, worth talking about because I think China has caused 
you know, a kind of derangement. It is causing a panic. And uh, I've, you know, I sometimes, I, I often say this, look, the, the U.S. goes picking on one, creating one enemy after another. But this time you have picked on the largest and longest lasting. There, there isn't going to be one after this. So, so there better be some way of de-escalating from it. Because there ain't going to be, uh, a, 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 this is not Iraq. You can't even fail at this. You can't even go in and get bogged down. This is going to be really, really bad right? if, it gets to, if it gets to blows. But well short of that, this uh, demonization was going on. I think to answer your question, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that made me speak up was these attacks on people during, during COVID. Uh, you know, one, my own safety. Uh, I, I live in a pretty sort of nice place, but even around here, uh, occasionally, you, you sometimes you, uh, you get accosted, right? Um, and, uh, you know, certain racial remarks are made. So it, it, um, the Asian community here had quite a, has had quite a time of it. And nobody wants to know about it, okay? Because this is the permissible racism of the moment. There was Black Lives Matter. There was BLM and so on. But suddenly you have this, and this is very inconvenient. And so it's, it's uh, you know, don't talk about this. Uh, but yet they're doing classic uh, techniques of racialization. So then one has to think further back and you realize that racialization, the introduction or the, the invention of race and its introduction as a concept for dividing and ruling people and for creating a certain hierarchy uh, race as a political, uh, as a power construct is very much part of how Asia is, is, is thought about. So, well, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question, but to, I, I couldn't keep quiet and be a human being. I, I couldn't, there, there's absolutely no way, um, you know, okay, personal again, I mean, what could I do? What job, how, how could I function and keep quiet about it? You know, when I came to the U.S., a lot of the work, I, whatever, what expertise or networks or knowledge I had was to do with Asia. But if you have this totally deranged, deluded idea of China, you also have a deluded idea about the rest of Asia. Please, it's even worse. They know nothing and they care nothing about Southeast Asia, right? Um, so it's... Um, no one wants to know. No one wants the truth. There have been times when I was a consultant uh, working on, on things in which, you know, you help people understand uh, a sort of business uh, environment, uh, an investment environment. Well, the whole thing is politicized and militarized now. There's no room for that, that, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, what we've been talking about is, is the the distortion of reality in the United States has almost made brittle the people of the United States when the truth hits. It's kind of like, you know, uh, parched soil. Yes, the water yes. The can't even find a way in. And even yes. I think when the water hits, yes. it must really yes. sting. Yes, um, yes. So it, that's a that's a lot. And I feel like everyone's taken in a lot today that you have been so generous. And I John, I, I just want to say to you, like, I know the courage it takes for you to be who you are, for you to give up a, a life that you've built and positions that you've built and, you know, your capacity to be someone in the world to instead, Thank you. to instead be what we should all be, which is human beings in relationship with each other. And the <laughs> that you have is that. And I, I think. But thank you. That's my experience of Asian values that I think might be a little painful for people that on the West that have those values of humanity kind of stripped from them as part of being in a white supremacist, uh, you know, uh, you know the the roots of the United States are based in in humanity, and so you know slavery and genocide of the indigenous peoples that we're still trying to heal from and change from, but humanity and being human is 
really at this moment in history the most important thing. So I just well, that's what you 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 taught us in, 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 in that space, honor... myself and 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 the, and the co-host, right? <laughs> I want to honor who you are as a human, and then um, I know we've like gone way over time, um, but. Hale, I, I want to do um, bring you in and and ask you to um, um, ask John some questions. Absolutely, yeah. I just want to say it's a pleasure to speak with you, John, and yeah, thanks, Jody. Thanks, everyone. You know, I I really thought it was interesting how you were talking about you know the link. Um, well, I mean, this is not what you explicitly said, but you know, I've been thinking about the link between kind of white supremacy and this notion of rules based order and how it's been propagated by, you know, Western governments. Um, and I think a lot about how that relates, especially to all the tensions in the South China Sea, where you have, you know, China, for example, has been uh, pushing for much more regional um, uh, dialogue and solutions to resolve different territorial disputes in the South China Sea. And, you know, the U.S., as you were talking about, was really intent with this pivot to Asia on freedom of navigation exercises and accusing China of violating a rules-based order. And, you know, I think things like the nine dash line, things like, um, you know, China mediating territorial um, disputes with Vietnam, with Malaysia, with other countries, this wasn't an issue that the United States was so obsessed about. 10, oh, you know, maybe 15 no. or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but it became such an obsession in, yep. you know, within the last 10 years. So how do you think, uh, why do you think that is? And how do you think it relates to this notion of a rules-based order? That it's deliberate. Just about? Yeah. That's why I started with this pivot to Asia business. There was a status quo with the U.S., the, the top dog in Asia. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's a, at a certain point, it became uh, not acceptable. And of course, it had a lot to do with uh, the rise of China. Uh, it's not accidental, I think, that this happened after the global financial crisis, in which actually the capitalism, global capitalism, Western capitalism was saved by, by, uh, by China, ironically. Um, but it's around that time uh, 2010 and so on, that the, the Chinese economy started to, well, it exceeded Japan's and then it started to be to, to, to be a threat to um, the U.S. economy in terms of, you know, um, which one was larger. And, um, and they had to be put down. It's really as, as simple as that. It does not tolerate uh, a, a rival. U.S. empire does not not even a rival, not rival in that sense. I mean, they did this to Japan, which was an ally, if you, if, if, if you know, uh, in the late 80s. They basically kneecapped the Japanese economy. Of course, it was possible to kneecap Japan. You have bases there, you know, you could bring them to heel. They are trying the same thing with, with China through these sanctions, and it's not going to work. So what next? So... Uh, you know, on, on one level, it is just, it, it, it is that. No one should, uh, the U.S. cannot, if you hear these people talk, this is bizarre language. I think DeSantis did it the other day too. Are uh, they becoming larger than us and therefore this is a mortal threat? I mean, what kind of insane, <laughs> how did you survive the first hundred years, you know, of your, of your, of your existence? Um, so that, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. At, at one level, it, it is that. And uh, that's how a lot of Asians see it. What they don't see is this embeddedness in, in racism, in settler colonialism, etc. That they don't see. That they're less aware of. That I saw as, you know, as an Asian person living, living here and understanding, wait a second, to understand this, the full depth of this. You need that, you need this perspective. I became a James Baldwin, Malcolm X guy here. Okay, uh, you know, I was, I was reading him and said, "All right, this is really, you know, the 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 sixties guys, the Black Power guys. They had, they understood things. They, uh, there was an, um, an identification with decolonization. 
uh, a solidarity with, with the third world uh, that was then killed. And, that, and we have the third world rising again now. Yeah, uh, I feel like, um, you know, I was living in China for three and a half years. I was um, in China during the, I was living in Beijing during the tail end of um, the unrest in Hong Kong. And, um, you know, some people were framing the the situation as uh, a project, a decolonization project. And, you know, I guess like, uh, what do you say to people who, I guess, regardless of whether or not, you know, um, you know, whatever is happening, whatever decolonization efforts are going on in Asia, um, how sincere they are and whether or not um, they are not sincere. Why do you think the U.S., like, what, what do you say to people who think the U.S. should be involved <laughs> either way? Because it seems like the U.S. getting so they involved. see you're, you're talking about Hong Kong as the, the well, protest general, movement as decolonization. No, no, no. Uh, uh, r rather the what the um what people in the mainland officials in, in the Chinese mainland were trying to yeah. do before. But I, yeah. I, I um that was what my colleague at, when I was working in Chinese news was telling me. But yep. Um, what, what do you tell people who? regardless of whether a decolonization effort is sincere or not, why the U.S. should be involved. Um, you know, because some people think, oh, the U.S. State Department has the best interest. Like, this is imperial thinking, you know, and is kind of everywhere around us. And so how do you converse with people? Um, the U.S. should get get out of the business of, of suppressing decolonization, which mm -hmm. is what the Cold War was about. Yeah. Hong Kong is... Your, your colleague was, is right. It's a case of a, and still ongoing decolonization. I come from Malaysia, which, which uh, obtained its uh, sort of independence in 1957. One part of it did anyway. It's not a complete process. As you can see in, in, uh, in Africa, and particularly in West Africa right now, it's not a complete process. Um, you know, I think we're going through a second and perhaps final uh, de de wave of decolonization going on now, a decolonization of world order. But Hong Kong, you expect that a place that was colonized was an utter colony for so long in 1997, has the process complete? No. You had people who were very, really colonized in their thinking, for example. Um, you had the, the attempt to preserve a colonial political economy in Hong Kong, which is what it was, this extremely exploitative community. Uh, uh, economy, as far as the, the working class were concerned, it's, it's inherited from the colonial era. If you, know, if you ask me, Beijing should have intervened earlier to not let it get to that stage. Hong Kong should have had some of the social equality that people in Guangzhou had, rather than become that, a, a kind of you know, extremely in, unequal uh, hellhole uh, for people at the lower end, uh, while being a, a kind of capitalist uh, paradise. A real estate and finance paradise, but so so there is a, a decolonization that Hong Kong has to go through, and it's none of the U.S. business, right? I what what I mistook you for saying earlier was, you know, there there are people on the left here who like to use that language and talk about the the protesters as uh, de decolonizing. I hate the way words like that's why I don't use them normally. You know, decolonize even settler colonialism and so on, they're bastardized later and virtualized by, you know, pseudo-academic uh, kind of uh, use. Um, there's a kind of left here that, that wants to be disconnected from or with no connection with actual attempts at attaining sovereignty in, in, in uh, the rest of the world. 80% of the world was under, and the land mass and the population of the earth was under Western domination, was colonized, uh, you know. And uh, that 80% of the world, I mean, it's not completed its, um, its, its path to, to, to freedom. Let's talk freedom, but in that sense. Well, and I think, you know, when we talk about freedom, we forget that that's freedom for everyone. Yeah. And so many times we look- And freedom with sovereignty. Right. We look yes. through a class lens instead of understanding there's a whole class that isn't free. Um, that, yes. you know, that is 
what isn't happening, you know, yes. across the, yes. the, the you, you tend to rely in Western media, it relies on a class of people on the other side that they have cultivated. Right. This, you know, the, the, these particular voices, all of whom uh, were educated at certain places, or they are being, uh, or, or they work, they're being funded by 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 certain organizations, uh, and that's their job. Their job is to reflect those uh, Western values uh, back. But if you actually live there and have any concern at all for people there, you would actually be looking more broadly and asking, how are people doing? And and I think that's the way to do it. One doesn't have to be an expert on Asia, you, you or, or you know, on any particular part of this this vast uh, uh, continent. But um, where, wherever you go, actually go, actually see people, actually actually observe their lives. Are they well? Are they not? As as Jody likes to say, relate to them as, as human beings. Yeah. Um, thank you, John. I know we've taken up over an hour of your yeah. time. I'm so grateful. This has been so interesting and. You know, I really wanted you here so that people could witness and hold space for a voice from Asia, because we listen to people that have never been to Asia and talk about Asia like they know what what's happening. So just to hear your thinking and your voice has been refreshing. Um, uh, thank you, Kale, for and Grace for holding us all together. And thank you. We've, we've gone over the hour. I just want to thank everyone for being here and say next week, our guest is Kale. So Kale has just joined the team. He's, you know, now the coordinator of this campaign, China's Not Our Enemy. But Kale lived for three and a half years in China during COVID. And I think it's going to be fun to hear from him of what that was like, another voice from, you know, let, like, let's hear from the voices from Asia because we don't realize how manipulated our brains have been by the propaganda, the stories and the lies. And let's, um, I call it the brain flossing. Our brains need a little bit of flossing um, so that we can also see and be clear and be humans together, um, just in our, list, our, our holding space for each other and listening. So John, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your commitment. And thank you for being in conversation with us today. Oh, you just made thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. all thank right. you all. And thanks for yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All right, good everyone. Night. Good night. And we'll see you next week, I hope. Bye.